All right, welcome to a video tutorial here on an introduction to trigonometric functions. If you've been watching this video series on trig functions, you're probably thinking, why hasn't he talked about what a trigonometric function is yet? Well, today you're gonna to get that answer in this video tutorial. We're gonna talk about trigonometry as it applies to functions. All right, so just a little bit of review. Uh, remember that functions are like machines. I've talked about this a little bit in my videos on functions. If you put an X value into this function, you know, you sub in any X, some stuff happens, and, and then a Y gets shot out. That's the way functions work, right? It's like an input-output mechanism. And we've seen this when we looked at parabolas and exponential functions. You can pick X values and you can substitute them into your function. Stuff happens. In this case, your X value gets squared and then a Y value gets spit out. Just like uh, for the same thing for exponential functions. If you pick X values and you substitute them in, you'll see that you get Y values spit out. Okay, well trig functions work the exact same way. So you can substitute numbers in for x and you get y values out. But for us, in, in this case, for trig functions, the x values represent an angle on, on your unit circle. We talked a little bit about the unit circle, uh, but the, the values that you're putting into your function are the angles that your terminal arm is rotating through. And the y values that come out represent the ratio of the side lengths. So I'm gonna do a quick demonstration here. Sorry about that. So here's my unit circle. I'm hoping you can see the whole thing here. Uh, so what I've got is the coordinates of my point A here. Remember, the coordinates of any point on the unit circle we can write as cos of the angle uh, uh, between the terminal arm and the x-axis and comma sine of that angle. Uh, so what I've done here is I've just shown you that if I move this, this, this point, okay, my angle here, uh, I've just called it angle x, my angle increases. So that's the angle that I'm substituting into my function. So if you picture cos x, picture f at x equals cos x as a function. If I substitute in, let's say 30 degrees, I'm not gonna be able to get it right on 30, but as close as I can possibly get to 30, you get a, about 0.86 out. So that's what I'm doing. I'm substituting in x for cos, or into, into cos of x, and I get this value out. Likewise, if I substitute in 30 degrees for x in sine of x, I get 0.5, which if you remember, if you think back to your special triangles, we know this to be true. The sine of 30 is 1 half. Okay, and that works uh, for, for any value on the unit circle as we rotate around. If we sub in x values into our function, we're gonna get y values out that represent the ratio that we're, that we're dealing with. So for the cos function, we'd be talking about the adjacent side to the hypotenuse. Uh, for, the, for sine, we're talking about the opposite side to the hypotenuse. Okay, just a little demo that I hope uh, illustrates what, what we're dealing with with trig functions here. Okay, so what I've done is I've just kind of generated a table of values here for you using my little unit circle demo. I've got x values from 0 to 360, and I'm going up in 30 degree increments. Uh, and I'm just, I've just shown you the y values that come out as a result. So as I work my way around that unit circle, you can see my, my y values change, and they change in kind of an interesting pattern. You can see they increase from zero to one, and then they decrease from one to zero, and then it, it seems that they're going into the negatives towards one, and then they start increasing back up to zero again. So this makes sense because remember, on that unit circle, once you start rotating your terminal arm around, there's always two values on your unit circle that have the exact same ratio. And you can see that here, for instance, 60 and 120 have the exact same ratio for sine. Likewise, we have 30 and 150. These guys are exactly the same. And it even works for these negative values as well. Okay, so it makes sense that as we work our way around the unit circle, we're periodically gonna be revisiting these values that we're getting for our y values. Okay, let me just clean up my chart a little bit here. So interesting uh, properties of these trig functions, you can see the maximum value, the highest value possible is one, okay, and the lowest value possible is negative one. That's gonna be um, important as we move on into our studies of trig functions here. Okay, the x-intercepts, the values where your, your y value is zero, you can see I've got one at zero, I've got one at 180, I've got one at 360. Those are your x-intercepts. Uh, if you were to keep rotating that angle or your, your terminal arm into you know, over 360 through to 720, you'd see that your x-intercepts go up in increments of 180. Okay, so you can test that on your own. 
the domain here, you can see I could substitute in any angle, and I kind of showed you that with my with my GSP demo. Any angle is possible. I can substitute any angle for angle X here, and I'm going to get a Y value out. Okay, so any angle is possible. That tells me that my domain is any real the set of any real number uh, of X, or X is an element of the real numbers uh, for our range. Remember, the range is the Y values that are possible for this function. It's not possible to get any Y values outside of the range of negative one and one. So we specify that in our range. Okay, so what I've done here is I've just made a quick rough graph of what the sine function would look like. Okay, for a moment, I just want you to ignore the negative values. But if you picture just starting at zero uh, for your the angle between your terminal arm and the X axis and increasing that angle, right? we can see if we increase it to 30, when we go over to 30, we're at 0.5 and so on. So we increase on our way up to one, and then once we get past 90 degrees, we start decreasing, we get to our x-intercept of 180 degrees, and then we continue in that in that fashion. Okay, and the same thing would happen if we, if we rotated backwards. So if we took this angle, for instance, and we rotated backwards, my, G, my GSP dem demonstration doesn't really show that, uh, but it, it, I, you, just, you can take my word for it that that's the case. Likewise, or, or otherwise, you could just punch in, for instance, the sine of negative 60 into your calculator, and you'd see that you, you do get negative 0.866. So that's the graph of sine of x. Okay, I've done the same thing for cos, again, using my, my GSP demo here. I've just kind of you know moved around my unit circle, uh, substituted different values in for my angle, and I've got the ratio of the adjacent side to the hypotenuse side of that triangle as a result. Uh, and again, similar results, um, same sort of numbers for uh, for our, our range, right? And we're working with 0, 0 0.5, 0.866, and 1. We've got the same max and min value. Our x-intercepts, however, are not the same. You can see they happen at 90 and 270. Uh, so they do increase, uh, you know, in intervals of 180, but they're not at the same location. Our domain's the same, we can always substitute an x value in and we'll always get a y value out as long as it's in between negative one and one. And if I just quickly do a rough sketch of this graph, you can see that it looks very similar to the graph of sine. However, let's just compare quickly. You can see that it, it, it appears that I'm taking this sine graph and I'm, I'm just gonna move a piece of it. it. It looks like I'm moving it to the left by a bit. And let's talk specifically about how much it is moved. Okay, so when we when we substituted in, sorry about that, lost my graph here. Uh, sorry, there we are, we're back. When I substituted in 90, I got one in my sine graph. Uh, but to get one for cos, you can see that I've substituted zero. So that means that sine and cos are essentially the same graph, but cos has been shifted to the left by 90 degrees. We're going to talk about that a little bit more in uh, in the series of videos that I'm going to do on trig functions. This is really just an introduction to what the graphs of sine and cos look like, and I, I really wanted to make that connection back to back to the unit circle because I feel like that's kind of a neat uh, an, a neat concept there uh, when we when we talk about that input output mechanism of the function. Okay, so that's the end of this video tutorial. It was just a quick introduction to trig functions. I'm hoping you are you know, kind of familiar with what a trigonometric function is at this point. Uh, we looked at the graphs of sine and cos. Uh, so moving forward, we're gonna talk about a little bit more, uh, more, more properties of these trig functions. And then of course, uh, we're gonna start translating them. We're gonna start stretching, compressing, and uh, doing all sorts of fun stuff with them. All right, so I hope you join me for those video lessons that are coming. As usual, thanks for watching.